before we begin our sermon, I just want to reiterate what uh, Brother Josh said about the G3 conference coming up. Um, that conference is uh, no doubt as, at least, where, at least where, where we stand right now in evangelicalism, is the most encouraging uh, national conference that you could attend. Um, the speakers this next year will be Vody Bauckham, Paul Washer, Stephen Lawson, and a number of others. In the past, John MacArthur has preached there. Um, he may this year, it's not been announced yet. But I would encourage you, if you are interested in attending that conference, that you would uh, attend the brief, very brief, um, after service meeting. Just want to give you a few details about that. Um, there is a significant um, registration discount that we receive since we are a G3 Church Network member. And we get half price for a little while. And so I want to take advantage of that if you uh, desire. Um, you, anyone that is hearing this right now in this room is, uh, can take advantage of that. So please see uh, me and Brother Josh after service. We'll hold a brief meeting in that little cry room right there. Okay, please open your Bibles, if you would. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4, and we are going to be beginning in verse 7. If you would stand, please. First Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. May God be pleased with the reading of his word. You may be seated. I'd like you to notice with me for just a moment um, what Peter has been doing in his writing up to this point. So if you could, just for a moment, look with me at the very beginning of this letter. Go back to chapter 1 of 1 Peter. Chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ... To those who reside as aliens. Now the ESV translates that exiles. And the King James Version translates that strangers. That's who he's talking to. Strangers, aliens, exiles. Look, just for fun, go to chapter 2. Look in verse 11. Chapter 2, verse 11. He says the, he says the exact same thing. Beloved, I urge you as what? Aliens and strangers. So Peter is saying to those Christians in his day, and Christian, he is saying to you today, you don't belong to who you used to belong to. You belong now, if you've been made alive in Jesus, by grace through faith in Him, you belong to God. So God is now your Father. No longer do you belong to the father of lies. God is your father. No longer do you belong to the perishable city. You belong now to the imperishable city. You belong to his kingdom, his land. But right now, you live in the flesh, in your body. You live here, and you journey 
as an alien, as a stranger, we've been using the phrase as a pilgrim in a foreign land, and it's not easy. We've talked about this, your best life is not now. No matter how much popular teachers want to tell you that. But one day, the earth will pass away, and God will make all things new. Peter hints at that. If you want to go back to chapter 1, look in verse 4. He hints at that. Chapter 1, verse 4. You're going to receive an inheritance that is imperishable. It can't be defiled. Then look in verse 5. And both your inheritance and you yourself, pilgrim, though all that is perishable around you is going to pass away, if you're in Christ, you are part of the imperishable. And you, are, you yourself are protected by the very power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, at the end of all things. In these last times, God is keeping you and your inheritance perfectly and certainly secure. We've talked of these things. So all that's promised to you, Christian. All of that is promised to you here in this text, in your Savior, Jesus Christ. You are looking forward to an inheritance that is imperishable while you are in exile right now in a foreign land, but you're journeying to Emmanuel's land. You're journeying to the celestial city. So that though you might die in the flesh today, because you've been spiritually baptized into Jesus Christ by grace through faith, Though you may die in the body, in the flesh, you will live forever in the Spirit. And make no mistake, you live now. Don't forget that. You live now. You live in a way that is completely new to the way you used to live apart from Christ. If you belong to Jesus, you've been born again. That's what it means to be spiritually baptized. And so everything about your life, this life, because of Jesus, this life in the flesh, everything changes. But you also have a living hope, which means everything about eternal life changes too. Everything about this life changes in Christ, and everything about eternity changes in Christ. So much so that for the Christian to die is called by Jesus as to just simply be falling asleep. You're not perishing. You're falling asleep according to the words of Jesus and entering glory. And you can take to the bank, this day you will be with me in paradise. Friends, for those of you who name Christ as Lord and Savior, as you enter glory, Peter is telling us, and he's been telling us really since chapter 1, that you're going to face the almighty judge. And that judge is both God the Son, the Savior, your Savior, Jesus Christ, and God the Father, your Father in heaven. There are texts throughout Scripture that seem to indicate that God the Son is going to be your judge, and there's also texts like our text today, um, and throughout First Peter, that it seems to indicate that God the Father is also the judge. So God is the judge, both in the sense of your Father and the Son, and this judge, think about this, he has placed upon himself all of the just condemnation that you should inherit. He has taken the judgment against your sin that you deserve for you upon him. So that all that is left to you, Christian, in Christ, at the judgment, all that is left to you is the smile of God. And so knowing in verse 18 of chapter 1, if you want to look there, knowing that you were not redeemed, verse 18, you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless the blood of Christ, knowing that the cost of of such a smile from the judge was so great. 
Knowing that that cost of that smile for you to be received with at the judgment was so great that in verse 17 of chapter 1, because you address as Father him who judges impartially according to each one's work, because of both of those realities fitting together, you desire so much that your life would count for him. You desire as someone who knows the cost it took for that smile to be yours. And you address him as father. You desire that your life would count for him. You want your life to be for his glory. You want your life to be for his son's sake. Because of what he and his son have done for you. What the triune God has done for you. And so as a result, Peter has been telling us, you live in the fear of the Lord. You're not afraid of condemnation. You're not afraid of, of this phrase that seems to be popular. You're not afraid of falling out of fellowship with God. Do not believe that phrase. God's grip is way too firm for that. It's impossible for those truly in Christ to be lost from time to time. They might be backslidden. But in Christ, there is no condemnation. You, you don't live in the fear of the Lord afraid of condemnation or afraid of falling out of favor with God. You live in the fear of the Lord by being in awe and having such a reverence for your thrice holy Father in heaven that you want to please Him. You want to revere Him. You want to count. You want your life to count for Him for eternity. In essence, you don't want to waste your life. You want chapter 2, verse 12. Go to chapter 2, verse 12. This is what you want if you truly know Christ. You want verse 12 of chapter 2. You want to keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. So that even, even among the lost, even in the midst of their slander and their mockery, God will get the glory. God will get the glory on the last day. That God would be glorified in the end. That's your, that's, it's your impetus, is what you desire. And that's what Peter has been writing. So if we see this consistently through the early chapters of 1 Peter, when you get to chapter 4, verse 5, and we're getting close, almost getting back to our text this morning, when Peter writes once more the same thing in chapter 4, verse 5, that all are going to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And that's been a theme in Peter. If you read that, if you're a Christian, and you're picking up Peter's consistent themes here, and you think about that, the judge is my rescuer, the judge is my almighty father, the judge is who smiles upon me in Christ. If that's who's to be my judge, if that's who I'm going to present, be presented to on the last day, that changes everything about the pilgrimage right now. It changes everything about the way you choose to live your life right now as a new creation in Jesus. Because you rejoice at the reality that Jesus Christ substituted himself for you when he died on the cross. He substituted his life, called it substitutionary atonement. He atoned, he satisfied the wrath of God for you and your sins by taking your place on the cross. You rejoice in that so that you know because of the work of Christ, I stand before God the Father presented in full splendor, wrapped in the robes of righteousness that are not mine but Christ's. That's why weddings are so cool. And that's why weddings are so dumb when the bride won't wear white. You miss the picture of the wedding. If the bride will not wear white, you do not proclaim the excellent, the excellent grace of God. The bride wears white so that it is just but a shadow of the reality that God will present all of those who have been purchased by the groom, Jesus, who wears the black, the darkness. That Jesus will present his bride spotless, without blemish. That's you, Christian. I think every time you go to a wedding and you see that bride come down, instead of being silent, we should erupt with amen. That you might get 
in trouble. As a result of all of that, because you've been clothed in the righteousness of Christ, because the judge is your father, because of all these precious gospel truths, what you do in this life matters to you because you know it matters to him. It's very simple. It matters to God and, and he sees all of your deeds. It matters to you that you are made for his good pleasure. And so you want to please him. Again, you want to please him not because you're afraid of judgment. You're not afraid of condemnation. You want to please him because that's what sons and daughters of God do. And if you doubt that, look here on earth at your own children. If you don't have children, look at the children of others. They yearn to please their father and their mother. Children do. You want your life to count for God. And that's what Peter said at the beginning of the letter. I just, we cannot forget the, the first three, three chapters of this book. Look in chapter one. Last time I'll make you flip back there. Chapter one, look in verse eight. Right, this is true of the Christian. Chapter one, verse eight. You want your life to count for him. It says, and though you've not seen him, Christ, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. So you say, if you're a Christian, my Savior, who purchased me at the cost of his life, will be who I stand before on the last day. And so you have to ask the question, if you truly know him, how on earth can I live for him? What's it going to take for my life to count for eternity? What does it look like for me to stand before my Father in heaven and have crowns to throw at his feet and adoration and fullness of glory and inexpressible joy and greatly rejoicing? How can I get to the end of my life and say, I didn't waste it, Father? I didn't waste it. And that's what Peter tells us in these verses. He tells you the way to a life not wasted in chapter 4, verse 7. Chapter 4, verse 7. If you can remember everything that we've talked about, these verses will make so much more sense. Peter is telling you the end of all things is near. The day of judgment is right around the corner. And that is, it's going to be either death first for you, or it's the second coming of Christ. So in light of all of that, Peter says, be of sound judgment, sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. And friends, I just need to say at the outset as we begin here looking at these verses, if you are lost, if you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that phrase at the, that phrase at the beginning of our text, the end of all things is near, that phrase should rock you. It should cause you to fall flat on your face. And you should say, I need Jesus. I am a sinner. And if the end of all things were to happen right now, and it may, I, would, I wouldn't stand welcomed by God the Father and the judge. I wouldn't be welcomed with a smile, but I would be cast into hell for an eternity. Because you bear the guilt of your sins. If that is you, I want to urge you, before we begin to talk to the Christians in this room, I want to urge you, be of sound judgment and be of sober spirit. Wake up. And this day, repent of your sins, for the end is near. Be at your death first to the second coming of Christ. And if you turn away from your sins, and by the grace of God, trust in Jesus, you will be saved and God will have done it. The end of all things is near. God save sinners. But brothers and sisters, this command is given ultimately to you to be of sound judgment. It's to, it could be translated be wise. That phrase sound judgment could be translated be wise, be self-controlled. It also could be translated don't be foolish. And it, then Peter says and have a sober spirit. Could translate that have a clear mind, sober up. 
wake up. In fact, in our day, we might just say, we might just say stop lollygagging. That's really the sense of the phrase. Stop messing around. You're going to stand before your Father in heaven. So don't waste what time you have right now on trinkets. Don't waste your life on things that don't matter, that don't count. Give your life to what matters, to what lasts. And then notice the purpose of it all, for the purpose of prayer. I wonder if you've thought about that. For the purpose of prayer. Have you thought about prayer and how essential it is for the life not wasted? I think we can get out of whack sometimes and put prayer down on the list of things that keep your life from being wasted. That's not what Peter says. Peter, prayer is essential for a life not wasted. Do you think that um, Peter knew this? Can you think of a time when Peter struggled with prayer? If you want to, you can go to Matthew 26. You don't have to. Matthew chapter 26, perhaps you remember Jesus Christ takes Peter and two others and he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember this? And Peter is, or Jesus is in great, great anguish. Great anguish. He knows what is coming. He knows he's going to give his life as a ransom for many. He's going to drink the full cup of God's wrath for the elect and he takes Peter and two others and he says to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. What's he saying? Keep watch with me, Peter. Peter, just share a little bit in the suffering. Share my suffering just a little bit, Peter. And then Jesus goes off for a little while, ways, and he and he and he, and he prays. Right, and he comes back, and one hour later, what does he find? He finds him sleeping. And Jesus says to Peter, "You." You couldn't keep watch for one hour? That phrase, keep watching, is nearly identical to the phrase, be sober. Kind of like sober-minded, sober spirit. You couldn't keep watching for, and for one hour. Keep watching, Jesus says. Keep watching and praying that you would not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Beloved, uh, prayer is an essential ingredient to an obedient, counting for eternity, not wasted life. You know that Holy Scripture tells you that God knows everything you need even before you tell Him, right? He knows everything you need even before you tell Him. So why pray? Do you pray to help God understand? No. Prayer isn't about helping God. Prayer isn't about informing God. Though you should inform Him, He already knows. That's not the impetus behind prayer. Rather, prayer is about God helping you. The foundation of prayer is your desperate need for Him. Prayer is dependence upon God manifest in the flesh. You need him desperately. So that's why Peter says, I'm going to use my translation, stop lollygagging. Sober up. Think clearly. Think clearly that so that you would depend wholly upon and truly Rely upon Almighty God to live in such a way that when the end of all things come, not all that you gave your life to will pass away. And then in the following verses, beloved, verses 8, 9, 10, and 11, Peter gives you, Christian, three manners, three ways in which this sound judgment and sober spirit prayer plays itself out in your life. So there's three ways to a life not wasted. Now, I want, you to sh I want you to see this for yourself. I want you to see how you could structure a sermon without me. You say, man, Pastor Grant's job is way too easy. I want you to see it. 
for yourself. So I want you to see first. Notice the phrase at the beginning of verse 7. The end of all things. You see that? End of all things. All things. Now I want you to go down to verse 11. Look in the middle there. What does it say? Look in the middle of the verse. So that in all things, all things God may be glorified. So again, I point this out a lot because I want to help you study your Bible. There are your bookends. All things, all things. And so, all things are passing away and you live so that in all things God would get the glory. That's the heart of anyone born again. And um, as a result of the end of all things and the reality that you're going to stand before God, the Father, as your judge, Peter urges you, be sober, give yourself to prayer because you're desperate for God's help. Indeed, if God doesn't help you in this, if God doesn't come to your aid, you can do nothing of eternal value. You can do nothing apart from Him. You won't be able to do anything that will last for eternity. And then after the command, right, so that, that's the command. It's actually the only command in these verses. It's the only imperative. I know it looks like there's more commands, but in the Greek, there's actually just one command in verse 7. Be of sound judgment and sober up. It's one big commandment. And then after that command, notice in verse 8, what are the ways in which this plays itself out in your life? How do you wake up? How do you not waste your life? And he gives you three. I want you to see it. So again, you can say, um, we don't need Pastor Grant. Look in verse 8. Above all, keep fervent in your love for who? One another. Look in verse 9. Be hospitable to who? One another. You see a repeated phrase? That's important. One, 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 one another. One another, one another. wonder what's going to happen in verse 10. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving who? One another. Those are, those are your keys. You look at your bookends, and you see there, oh, repeated phrase, repeated phrase, repeated phrase. And those are my three points. Because that is Peter's three points. Three keys to a life not wasted. Here are the three manners in which you may live a life that will count that God might get the glory. And let me just give you those three. You've already seen them. Love one another. Show hospitality towards one another. And help one another. And all of that, again, you cannot miss this. If you miss verse 7, you miss the whole thing. All of that is undergirded with prayer. Absolute dependence upon God. And if you do that, if your dependence is upon God, He will work these things in your life and in this church. And He will get the glory, and church, you will get the joy. And that will be wonderful. So there's the structure for you. The book ends and the three one another's. So in the next few minutes, just the next few minutes, let's, let's look at how, how, to, how to live a life not wasted. And the first is, prayerfully, Hold on to your love for one another. Hold on to your love for one another. Again, let's read verse 8 so you can see this clearly. Above all, above all. So everything I'm about to say, Peter's saying, is rooted in this description. Love. If you don't got love, you got nothing. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Now, Peter has already said the same thing in chapter 1. I already told you I'm not going to make you flip back there, but I'll tell you. Chapter 1, verse 22. He said the same thing. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. In both instances, in chapter 1 and in chapter 4, that phrase, fervent, could be translated, hold on tightly to. You could translate it, put it on. You could translate it, wear it. Just think about that. Wear love for one another. Put it on like a garment. Hold fast to it. Hold on to one another in love. And again, I, po I pointed this out, but that phrase, above all, if you cannot hold tightly to one another in love, you can't do anything else in this life that God invites you to do and commands you to do, Christian. You don't have love. You can't do anything else he's asked you to do. And that's what 1 Corinthians 13 says. 
The famous love passage, right? If you don't have love, you could have everything else in this world, everything else, but it would all pass away. Not a shred of it would remain because you don't have what's eternal. So love is at the very foundation for those who are new creations in Christ. I hope that becomes apparent in the next 15 minutes as we go through these verses. Think about John 13. Think about John 13, 34, and 35. This is how foundational love is for the, for, for the Christian. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. So I typically, when I read that, I stop right there and I ask Jesus, okay, how? What does that look like, Jesus? How does it, what does it look like to love one another? And of course, in his kindness, he responds, Jesus responds, love one another even as I have loved you. So love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So you love Christian because God first loved you. You love because Jesus loved you and gave himself for you. And what, does that, what did that love look like? It looked like the only sinless man going to hang on a tree for you. It looked like dying on a cross to secure your forgiveness, to make you right with God. That's what love looks like. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. This is what Paul says in Ephesians. If you uh, want to write this down, Ephesians chapter 1, 4 through 6, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption of sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed upon us in the beloved. And so as a result, three chapters later, Paul says in Ephesians 4.32, so because of that, because in love he predestined you to adoption as sons. Because, it, because, because of the great cost at Calvary, Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other. And you've got to ask the question, why? And then he says, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Brothers and sisters, if you belong to Jesus, you know your sin against the thrice holy God. You know the damnation that should be the result of it. And yet, because of the love of God in Christ, your sins have been forgiven. They've been dealt with. You've been separated from your sins as far as the east is from the west. And that love that God in Christ has demonstrated to you was before the foundations of the world. He could foresee every single one of your evil deeds. He could foresee and knew every single evil thought that would ever enter your mind. He knows your wickedness better than you do right now. He knew it before the foundation of the world. And yet in God's great kindness to you, he made a covenant with the Son in eternity past to say, I, knowing all of the evil of that man and that woman, I will pay at the cost of my son's life for them to be one of mine. You want to talk about love? And then the son went willingly to seal your pardon. And if that's true about the love of God, how he has loved you, when you read Christian verse 8, keep fervent in your love for one another, Hold on to one another in love. You cannot experience the vertical love of God in, who unconditionally, he doing everything, who went in eternity past, decided to save you, knowing all of your evil. You cannot experience that kind of love and not bend it towards one another. If you can't bend the love that you've experienced with God in Christ to one another, you do not know the love of God. Isn't that what Jesus said? Jesus said that. I mean, by this, he says, by your love, you will know. You will know. If 
that you are my disciples. You, you will know if you belong to me by the, your ability, by the capacity for you to love. I hope, you, I hope you begin to see why prayer is essential in all of this. Why communion with God is essential in all of this. If you don't experience this vertically with God, how on earth can you do this horizontally with one another? If you can't commune with God and you, in prayer, recognizing, look at the love of God in Christ, Prayer's gone. If the vertical's gone, you got no hope with the horizontal. No doubt, I think, in this passage, we're to be reminded of the, the slave and the master. You remember the slave who owed his master a lot of money, perhaps. And uh, that slave uh, pleads with that master who owed, he owed the master a great deal. And he pleads with him for mercy. And the master looks upon the slave with pity in his heart. And very graciously forgives that slave of all his debts. He doesn't even say pay it back later. It's forgiven. That same slave goes to a fellow slave who owes him a great deal of money. But not nearly what he owed to the master. Goes to a fellow slave who owes him less money. Demands the payment. The fellow slave cannot pay. And what does the slave who's been forgiven much do? Chokes him. Pay me! And of course, that slave throws the other slave in prison. You can't pay me. You've got to go to prison. But who ends up in the eternal prison? Well, the slave who couldn't forgive, right? The master comes, sees what he had, how he has treated his other slave, and throws that slave in prison eternally. And Jesus said, and lest you, lest you mistake this, the point of that parable that Jesus tells about the master and the slave and the other slave, the point of the parable isn't so that you forgive so that you can be forgiven. If I just forgive, God's going to forgive me. That's not the point of the parable. The point is, if you truly tasted, if you truly tasted of the vertical forgiveness of God, the vertical love of God, you want others to taste it too, right? I mean, how many times you go to a restaurant and you, you've got to taste this. You've got to, look, you've got to get a plate of this, right? Is that just me? I got a lot of blank looks. You can't help but desire to treat your fellow debtor in the same way that you've been treated. And you know deep down, it's not even close. I'm treating a a fellow debtor this way. When I've been, when I've sinned against the thrice holy God. It's a mark of the new birth that you love one another. It's a mark that you have truly tasted of the love of God in Christ. So that's why Peter says that phrase, love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. Now I want to quote Spurgeon for you. Listen to Spurgeon. Love covers a multitude of sins, not your sins, not your sins, but the sins of your friends, your brothers and sisters, so that you will not see them. Where love is thin, faults are always thick. Wherever there is true love in the heart, however, we can make many apologies and allowances for the weaknesses and infirmities of our friends. Often, in love, we cannot see the faults in them. And when we know that they are there, when the faults are there, we go backwards like the godly sons of Noah and cover the nakedness upon which we will not even think of looking. For love covers a multitude of sins. Isn't that so good? That illustration of Noah and his sons. As sons and daughters of God, rather than look at the sin of my, rather than look at the flesh and the sin of my fellow sibling in Christ, rather than want to gape at that and dig into it a little bit, rather than that, my heart's desire is to walk backwards as the sons of Noah did to honor those for whom Christ has died. Christ died for you too, brother. Christ died for you too, sister. So how do, 
I don't want to gaze upon your flesh. I, I want to help you deal with it, and I want to cover it. May we be like those two faithful sons of Noah. Huh? May God do that in our midst. Love one another as God in Christ has loved and forgiven you. So the end of all things is near. A life not wasted is one that looks like fervent love, holding on to one another, bearing with one another in love. Uh, the second key to a life not wasted, prayerfully. Again, I'm going to say prayerfully before each of these. You don't have prayer, you, don't, you can't do this. You need God. The, f- the second key, show hospitality to one another. Now, I think often hospitality is thought of as only a qualification for pastors, for, for elders. Right? You see uh, Paul includes that word hospitality in a list of qualifications in 1 Timothy 3. Right? An elder should be hospitable. And that's true. To be a, a faithful shepherd of God's people, you've got to be hospitable. But here, Peter helps us realize one of the ways that love for one another manifests itself in the life of all believers, not just pastors, is by hospitality. The way you welcome your brothers and sisters into your home and into your life. So verse 9. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Now what is unique, and this is really neat, saints. What is unique about that word hospitality, it is composed of two Greek words. First Greek word is philo or philo or philo. And philo is like where we get Philadelphia, right? Phileo. Philo could be translated love. So love. And then the second word for hospitality is xenos. Xenos is the Greek word for strangers. So love the who? Love the strangers. I made a big deal at the beginning of this sermon to remind you who is Peter talking about. He is talking about those of us in this world that are strangers to the world. We are exiles, aliens, strangers to the world, but to one another family. Not strangers to one another. Hospitality could be legitimately translated love for the stranger. So when you see a fellow pilgrim, a fellow stranger in need, Peter says, meet that need. Love the stranger because the stranger is family. And then Peter says, he adds that little part, uh, do this without complaint. You could translate it without grumbling. So many of you know why he says that, right? Right? So many of you know, if you've ever exercised hospitality, why he says it, because hospitality is hard. You know um, when the busyness of life makes it so tempting to put off and put off and put off, inviting others into your home and into your life and getting getting together with one another and meeting needs. And, And some of you know how it can be so easily taken advantage of, hospitality. So easily taken advantage of. Hospitality can be wearisome. And so what you need, if you understand there why he says, don't complain, don't grumble, you need to hear and remember Matthew 25. Matthew 25, 35 through 46. Jesus said, for I was hungry and you gave me something to drink. Or you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, he says, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, Jesus said, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer Christ and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we feed you? When were you thirsty? And give you, when when did we give you something to drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and invite you in? When did we clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? When? And the king, Jesus, will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. You did it to me. I think that helps with weariness. And don't forget Hebrews 13 too. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. I believe that's talking about primarily brothers and sisters in Christ in the local context. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained 
angels without knowing it. Hmm. So friends, as C.T. Studd said long, long ago, you only have one life, and it's going to be soon past, and only what's done for Christ will last. Hospitality is one of those things done for Christ and so it's of eternal value. It's going to last. You, you give yourself to hospitality. You give yourself to something that will last. Hospitality. Strangers to the world, but not strangers to one another. Now, I think, before we move on to the third one, and we're almost there, real briefly, how do you cultivate that? How do you, get, how do you work hospitality in your life? I got a few suggestions, just a few. Invite someone into your home. <laughs> That's a no-brainer. Ask to be a part of the lives of others. Maybe join a small group. We've got a small group starting in the coming months. Consider joining that. Have a saint from this room that you don't know very well over to your home just for ice cream. Maybe just coffee. Now, it doesn't have to be elaborate beloved, right? We all think it needs to be, by the way. Let me just point something out to you. The text doesn't say, be hospitable with a clean and perfect house, with the most delicious of all foods, and perfectly behaved children. No, I don't, I don't, I don't see it. The Lord your God simply says, don't be strangers to one another. And beloved, if we are honest, we are at times. Love one another, Show your love towards one another by the way you open up your home in all of its inconsistency and in all of its failures. <laughs> Come over to the pastor's house here in a little bit. You want to see some inconsistency? You want to see some, a guy trying his best to trust Christ and lead his wife and children and do it very imper imperfectly? <laughs> Just ask my mom and dad. I've seen it all week. Open up your home and your life to those purchased by the blood of Christ and you will be richer for it. You'll be richer for it. A third and final key to a life not wasted. What to give yourself to that it might last forever. Prayerfully, help one another. Now I get the word help from the word serve. Serve could be translated help in verse 10. It could be translated either way. But let's, let's read those verses. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. So in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, beloved, we are going to come back to these two verses, verses 10 and 11, when we get to chapter 5. Chapter 5 speaks about elders and the gift of teaching. And I believe, it's very, very clear, those two verses need to be joined together, not forgotten when you get to chapter 5. So we're going to come back to these, and we're going to elaborate more on these two verses. So I'm only going to pick out two simple, plain, abundantly important realities in these two verses about helping one another. And we're going to come back. So don't think I'm skipping stuff. I'm not. We're going to come back in two weeks. But for this morning... Notice first, <coughs> notice first, I, 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 look at the time, I'm, I'm not supposed to worry about time, Madeline told me, don't ever say that again. Okay, so um, I will, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. I want you to just notice for just, for, for just a second, notice how in chapter 4, uh, verse 3, Peter seems to make a contrast. Let's show you, this is really fun. And really encouraging. Look in verse 3 of chapter 4. For the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. You got that? So now in our verses, he said, love one another, show hospitality to one another, and serve one another, help one another. Notice the difference. Notice there. Instead of sensuality and lust, fill yourself up with what? Love. Instead of wicked partying, 
which happens in people's homes, instead of drunkenness, give yourself to godly hospitality. Instead of giving yourself to idolatry, what is disgusting and forbidden, abominable things, instead of giving yourself to those things, give yourself to serving one another in Christ. Isn't that neat the way Peter compares the old life and the new life in Christ. That was who you used to be, but oh, look at what Christ has done in you now. Look at what happens when Jesus gets a hold of you. So, that was not one of the two things I was going to point out in verses 10 and 11. I wanted you to see the contrast. So I've got two things for those two verses, 10 and 11. First, notice How are we going to help one another? How do you serve one another? You're to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Notice that. You're to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. How is it that you serve one another? The first way, be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You've experienced the grace of God in Christ. God's grace to you is so sufficient, more than sufficient. It's wonderful, and you just get grace upon grace, God's undeserved favor upon you, and all of that is not based on the character of the recipient. It's all based on the character of the giver. Grace is based on the character of God. And so because of that, because it's all by His grace, you manage, you steward the gifts that God has given to you well, because that's what they are. They're just gifts. You didn't earn a drop of them. There wasn't a single atom within you that God said, oh yeah, here you go. Not the way it happened. They didn't come from you. Every gift that you have, God gave them to you in his grace. So don't look at your gifts and use them to say, whoa, look at me. But look at your gifts and marveling at the kindness of God that he would treat you this way. Look at your gifts and say, how on earth can I leverage these things for you, for them? That's what it means to be a good steward of the manifold grace of God. And I would encourage you, beloved, do not bury your gift. Do not bury your talent, pun intended. Do not bury your talent in the ground. waiting around to use it. Do you know what happened to the one who buried his talent in the ground? Not good things. So while the end is not yet here, steward your gift unto the person, unto the family that you see right here to your left and your right behind and in front of you. Leverage them for your sibling. Second, how do, you, how do you serve one another? How do you help one another? I notice that, that phrase, you are to help one another in the strength that God supplies. And this goes back to the beginning of our passage this morning. You are desperately dependent upon God. That is why prayer is so vital and essential. If he doesn't give you the strength, you can't do what he requires. So when you obey... When you love one another, when you demonstrate hospitality towards one another, when you serve one another with the gifts that God has given to you all by his grace, the reason that you did all of that was because God was at work in you. It's all because of Christ within you. And in that way, the end of verse 11 happens. In all things, God gets the glory. You want God to get the glory? Begin with prayer and serving, loving and showing hospitality, all oh, that's love. Doing these things in a way that can, it can only be explained as it was from God. And God will get the glory. And you get the joy of a life not wasted. And so if you're wondering, you know, what does it mean to serve one another? What is it, I mean, what is it, re- give me a little more concrete. What does, it, what does it look like to serve one another? I don't have to take you anywhere else but to the words of Jesus where Jesus himself says, I did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give my life as a ransom for many. That's the way to serve one another. If you ever wonder how it is you're to live in this world, look to Jesus, he's shown you.
So again, I'll quote that line from C.T. Studd, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Only what's done for the glory of God will make it through the fire. The rest is going to be burned up like chaff. And so I think a question that we all need to ask at the end of this text is, in response, how should I live today? How should I live today in light of all of these things, all of the ways that I'm shown that this is, these are the keys to a life not wasted? How, how should I live? And I want to encourage you to listen to Jonathan Edwards, one of his resolutions. Edwards wrote this resolution in response he wrote this when he was really young, in response to the end of all things being at hand and the reality that, Jesus belong, that to Jesus belongs all the glory forever and ever, amen. In light of that, this is what Jonathan Edwards writes, one of his resolutions. I am resolved never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. Resolved never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. What's he saying there? Very, very simple. I think he's saying I want to live my life in such a way that if God called me home in the next hour, I wouldn't be sad about what I gave myself to that hour. Now, don't get that twisted. Don't think that that means um, that there's only some things that last. A lot of people will, will immediately go to when they think, how, how, can I, how, can, how can my life not be wasted? I've got to move to Africa and be killed by the Taliban. That's it. It's absolutely one way to do it. But Peter would have you understand that that is not the only way for a life to last. He would have you, I think, not be sad about what you gave yourself to today. So what would that look like? Parent, he has given you a child with an eternity. Invest in them. Be faithful. Do you know that children are multipliers? That's what they are. They multiply what's in your home. What's in your home? If it's not good, get some hospitality going. Get some good stuff in your home. Invest in them. Spouse, he has given you a husband or a wife that Christ would be displayed in your marriage towards one another. Invest in him, invest in her. Church member, he has given you one another. Invest in them. Love them, serve them, invite them in. Get to know them in the way that God has done that for you. And you can hit the pillow at night and say, I am not sad and if this is my last day on eternity, I made it count. There'll be no books written about you, perhaps. You don't need them. Your name's written in the book of life. Let me end with this. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father's not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, it's not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world's passing away and all of its lusts. But the one who does the will of God endures forever. And this is the word of God. Let's pray. Our Father, you have shown us much from your word this day. How precious your word is to us, to those who are alive in Jesus. But to those who are perishing, it, it, it might be foolish. Would you reveal their foolishness to them right now? For all of us in this room, Lord, that see these three keys to a life not wasted and say, I, I have done all of these so lousily. Would you remind us of the smile we have in Christ? How there is more righteousness and mercy in him than there is sin in us. And how, Lord, you have given us this day, this day, you've given us right now to do those three things. Would we do that for your glory in the strength that you supply? In Jesus' name.